Welcome to A Course in Miracles, Living the Love, Walking the Talk, with Rev. Jennifer Hadley. Bonjour, bonjour. <laughs> it's a rainy day here in New Jersey, and oh, I'm grateful. I am so grateful. I'm always grateful that we get to come together and transcend time and space this way with this radio broadcast. I'm so grateful for all the people who write to me and tell me what this uh, show means to them. I'm so grateful for people who suggest topics. And I've been doing suggested topics for a while now. There is a form you can fill out at livingacourseofmiracles.com if you'd like to submit a topic to me. I'm happy to receive it. Also at livingacourseofmiracles.com forward slash radio. You can always search there for a keyword and find all the shows related to that keyword. Um, relationship, healing, whatever it is that you're interested in. And today, we're interested in mysticism. And we have my good friend and a uh, man I greatly admire, John Mundy. Reverend Dr. John Mundy is here with us in the house. Hey, John. Hi, how are you doing this morning? I'm good. I'm good. And... Uh, we're going to talk about John's work with mysticism, his study of the great mystics, and how uh, it correlates to A Course in Miracles. I'm very excited for our conversation. And before we dive into it, uh, I am going to say a prayer, as I always do. I'll tell you a little bit about John, in case you don't know, after that. So I'm going to invite everyone to place their hand on my heart, on their heart. Uh, it would be hard for everybody to put their hand on my heart. But <laughs> we put our we'll hands on our heart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So energetically, we're declaring our wholeheartedness here, that we're wholeheartedly joining with the higher Holy Spirit self, our true identity, that great guide who guides us into the mystic, the Holy Spirit. We're joining together for a holy purpose. We declare our intention in this coming together. It's our healing. It's our awakening. We are coming together to consciously shed the thoughts, beliefs, ideas, concepts that do not serve our life of love. We're declaring our willingness to be truly helpful by offloading the false beliefs and ideas, and we're grateful to step into the mystic today and to recognize our own mystical self. So grateful and thankful for the opportunity to share the healing that we experience with everyone because we're one with them. So we are changing our mind by joining together in gratitude. We let it be, and so it is. Amen. Amen, amen. And I could probably spend quite a bit of time introducing John. He's been a regular guest on this broadcast over the last seven years. He, um, John, was your first book called Missouri Mystic? No, no, my first book was uh, called Awaken to Your Own Call. That was back in the mid-90s, 93, 94. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that book is still available. People love that book. Sure. Uh, You have What is Mysticism, and then you have uh, the most recent one, Mysticism and Miracles. And uh, John's also doing a class on that topic right now, and we'll we'll get into that as we go forth. But John's probably one of John's most popular books is Living a Course of Miracles, and um, so you can you can get all these books and Miracles Magazine, which John has been publishing for what thirty years now. Thirty three. Thirty three years, a mystical number. Yeah. <laughs> and uh <laughs> right it's right. the number of the ascended masters 33 or right. 3 so um one of the questions i get all the time john uh is that i'd love to ask you first and hear your 
your response to it is, what is a mystic, what is mysticism? Well, first of all, um, mysticism is the most natural state that there is. (laughs) So having said that, what I really mean by that is the state of consciousness that we're in most all the time, most all of us, is unnatural. By that I mean it's the state in which the ego seems to rule the mind. And when the ego rules the mind with all its worries and fears and anxieties and past and future stuff coming up all the time, health issues, relationship issues, money issues, the mind is full of junk, which is not natural. There's a principle number six of the 50 miracles principles says miracles are natural. When they do mm. not occur, something has gone wrong. Mm. And then it also says that unnatural thinking will always be attended with guilt because it's a belief in sin. So mysticism is the same thing. It's perfectly natural. In fact, it's the only natural thing that there is. It's the state in which we are when we are 100% back into our right mind. It's the state mm. of mind that we would have when, let's say, we're in heaven when we're enlightened, when we have uh, completed this world. And, you know, the Course in Miracles says this is an insane world. And it take, doesn't take very much for us to realize that this is an insane world. All you got to do is watch the news any night of the week, and you see that it's an insane world. And it's always been an insane world. And you look at all the wars and anxiety and really cruel things that this world is. Uh, it's interesting. I've been my wife and I have both been reading uh, some Mark Twain. Mark Twain really understood that this was an insane world. He called it the damned human race. He also recognized that he was a part of the damned human race. To use his <laughs> own terminology, <laughs> but he didn't know a way out of it. But if you read his last book, the last section of his last book, Mysterious Stranger, it's pretty clear that he describes this whole world as a dream and not a very nice dream. It's more of a nightmare than anything else. Well, The Course in Miracles does exactly the same thing. So mysticism is natural. So it's really what we're trying to get to do, what's happening in the mystical experience is we're getting back to our natural mind, to the mind that the way the mind is before it got distorted by coming into this world, by coming into this world, I mean by beginning trapped within the context of an ego and then the, all the ego projections that we throw out onto the world. So mystic people have always had mystical experiences, which really just means that there's always been opportunities for people to kind of have breakthroughs, moments in which the truth dawned on the mind for whatever reason, it just it just came into the mind. Uh, I can give you a whole fact is uh, on this course that I'm teaching, I go through a whole list of different things that it, that stimulate the mystical mind. And, and very often it's just, um, it's something that comes when we get really relaxed and we're really peaceful. I was just recently, as you know, in Scottsdale, Arizona, gave a talk in Mesa, uh, Arizona, and I had people talk mm-hmm. about their own mystical experiences. And this one woman described the mystical experience in which she was just, as a child, she was laying flat on the earth, just absolutely flat on the earth, looking straight up into the sky, and she just kind of disappeared. And she had this pro- profound religious experience, and she was trying to describe it to people. And then she sent me an email the next day, and she says, I don't think people understood how profound that experience was. One of the basic characteristics of a mystical experience, we'll go through a whole list of characteristics in the class I'm teaching. One of the basic characteristics is an ineffability, which simply means that you just really cannot describe the experience. You can dis- you can try. Poets get close to it. There are times I could give you a quote from, uh, Emerson, which maybe I will, which is a perfect description of a mystical experience in about three sentences. But um, so you don't know what it's like until you actually have the experience. 
having the, and by the way, I want to say everybody has had the experience. And often the point at which you've had that experience is when you were a child, very young, actually pre-verbal, partly because once the verbal comes in, then the discrimination comes in, and then the rights and the wrongs and the goods and the bads and the pretties and the uglies, which is a part of the divided mind. So the mystical mind or the miracle-mindedness would would be not a divided mind. It would be just seeing things the way that they are and letting me I've got a good cartoon that I like to use when I teach the class. It's a it's a picture of uh, a man and a dog. It's a cartoon and they're <laughs> drawing. They're standing looking at four trees. And in the man's mind there are all this there's a car and a woman and a couple people fighting and a sad looking face and a dollar bill and all this stuff that means that that's what's going on in the man's mind. And that's what he's seeing. And the dog, then there's a little blurb up above the dog, and it shows what the dog is seeing. And what the dog is seeing is the dog is seeing four trees. <laughs> because that's what's in front of him is four trees. The dog right. is just seeing what's right, <laughs> what's there, whereas the mind is. I remember once I was on a beautiful beach in St. John's in the Virgin Islands and laying on this absolutely white sand, golden beach, palm tree, blue sky, blue sea, and I'm laying there thinking, worrying about money. <laughs> Here I am right. in this kind of <clears throat> ideal condition, and I'm worrying about money. <laughs> so it, it's not necessarily the circumstances that we are. Uh, in that can induce uh, that state of awareness. But meditation can do it. A Course in Miracles can help you do it. The Course in Miracles is really intended to help us to get to a place of peace. That's what it says on the very cover of the book. It's t- published by the Foundation for Inner Peace. And then when we, get to, when we get to inner peace, that is, now we're beginning to get into the mystical mind. There's a line in the Course in Miracles where it says, uh, Peace comes to the quiet mind. Well, first we got to get a quiet mind. So how do you get to a quiet mind? And there's different ways to to do that. Recently, I did a program on YouTube. I do a once a month program called Miracles in Manhattan. I skipped this summer. We'll start up again in November. But um, I did it with a friend who's a Zen Buddhist, and so. The whole thing was on comparing Zen and A Course in Miracles. Well, both of them have the same intention. By that, I mean they both intend to get to this peaceful, quiet mind. The process is a little different in that in Zen, the basic process is one of meditation. So we just we meditate, long meditations even, to get to this kind of empty mind or quiet mind place. The process of A Course in Miracles on the other hand, is to heal all of our relationships. So by healing all of our relationships, we then have a peaceful mind because our mind is being distracted by difficulties that we have with personal relationships or with money or with anything in the world. So that's a a simple begin to ask your question. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I, I appreciate that you are uh, aware of tools that people can use to help get into that mystical state, that you're sharing that and teaching that in your class, and that you are aware that everyone has this mystical ability, this mystical connection. Oh, and. Yeah. For me, when I read A Course in Miracles, when I am present to the teaching and what I notice in my life and in the lives of all the people around me who are working the lessons, what I notice is that as we remove the blocks to love by offering them to the Holy Spirit, letting go of our opinions, our judgments, our hurtful thoughts towards ourselves and others, As you were saying earlier, which I think is so important, John, is that our natural state is then revealed. All this 
agitation, mm-hmm. all causes of suffering are concepts that we have added on to ourselves over the many lifetimes. And this is the lifetime that we can really wholesale, let it all go, and the Holy Spirit will take it out of our mind if we allow it. And then our mystical oh, yeah. mind is there for us. Well, you said a key word there, if we allow it. <clears throat> We've got to allow it. That, of course, plays a lot of importance on willingness, the willingness to be able to to see what has always been there. It's always there. It's just we we, we stop blocking it. That, that that's the whole thing. Stop obscuring it. There's a wonderful line. It's the last line of Lesson 52 of the Course, uh, which I like to quote a lot. Um, this is something you say to yourself. And what you say to yourself is, would I not rather join in the thinking of the universe? Whoa, think about that for a second. What is the thinking of the universe? We could go on a long time about that. I won't, but we might come back to it at some point. Would I not rather join in the thinking of the universe? You could think of that as the mind of God. Rather than to continue to obscure, that's interesting, to darken, to block out, what's really mine with all of my pitiful, meaningless, private thoughts. So it's all these pitiful, meaningless, private thoughts, these guilt thoughts, these fear thoughts, these anxious thoughts, that block our ability to have this as a natural state of mind. So. Exactly. And right. so right. I know that we we love A Course in Miracles because it, it le- it, it it's a step-by-step. Yes. It <laughs> works. It works. It works. That's the main thing about it. It takes patience. It takes time. It takes practice. We've got a workbook with 365 lessons, and thank God we do. If the Course in Miracles only consisted of the textbook and it didn't have that workbook in it, there'd be not so many people studying it because it's the workbook that really makes it work, that makes it happen, that really engages the the transformation process for you. So now I'm curious to ask you, John, the... In doing the, what inspired you to write this book, Miracles and Mysticism? Well, first of all, I've always had a, an inclination toward wanting to know, we, we all do, uh, what the truth is. And it really began, I grew up on a farm in Missouri back in the 40s and the 50s, and it was really kind of a blissful time. By that I mean it was kind of quiet, nothing like the complex worlds that we live in today. I think it was very, very simple uh, growing up on a farm. We didn't have the technology to get in the way for one thing. And um, I had some mystical experiences as a child. I won't go into elaborating them once when I was really quite young. It's just By that, I just mean the experience of being really connected, uh, connected with nature, connected with animals, um, and then I had one profound experience when I was 14, when I was I was hunting in the woods, and just very briefly, all I did was there's a thing you do when you hunt we call it freezing, where you just stand perfectly still. And I would just I did that I was just standing perfectly still, so the animals don't hear you tromping through the woods, and and if they can't hear you, and some and if they're not downwind from you, they can't smell you. Some animals right. can get very close to you before they'll see you. I mean, like a squirrel can get really close. Oh, my God, a human being. You know? <laughs> and I, I'm a kid, so I play a game. And the game is I don't exist. There's nobody here. There's no hunter hunting. There's no thinker thinking. And for some reason, and by the way, I've had several people now. I can come up with a list, literally of people who have this experience around the age of 14. There's something about as we're moving away from childhood into a more adult mind that can bring this on. And usually it's 14 or 15 that this happens. Anyhow, I decided to play a game. And the game was I don't exist. As I said, there's no hunter hunting. There's no thinker thinking. 
And for some reason, it was really like that. I entered into this sort of, I just slipped into the like Zen state. There was no hunter hunting. There was no thinker thinking. And the thing which brought me back was the thought, what is having this experience? And and then I heard this inner voice which said, who wants to know? All it said, who wants to know? But I knew at that point that I was going to spend the rest of my life trying to answer that question. And the only place that was dealing with that kind of a question for a kid in Missouri back in the 50s was uh, the church. So I got involved and became a minister and continued. I started teaching courses in comparative religions. Uh, oh, uh, I taught high school courses then. Back in 1966, was I was teaching in a high school in California, and it just continued. I mean, compared, I taught for 10 years. I taught a class called on comparative mysticism to the New School University in New York City, from 68 to 78, and it's always just been that way. Just constantly looking for, and we all are. We're all constantly looking for the answer. If you're putting any effort into it at all. I love uh, Einstein. Einstein was a true mystic by saying that the, the most beautiful and profound, and profound emotion we can experience is the mystical. I'll give you the exact quote. It says, He to whom the emotion, this emotion is a stranger who can no longer wonder and stand in rapture and awe is as good as dead. To know that what is impenetrable to us really exists is at the center of true religion. And he was a really, because he said, Einstein said, I, he, what he wanted more than anything else was to know the mind of God. And his process, of course, for coming to know the mind of God was through mathematics. Now, that's not the approach that many of us can even begin to, to take, but we can. You don't have to be a mathematician to understand the mind of God. Because it's just, it's innately there. It's like, again, if I can quote the row, who again was a true mystic, says, what lies behind us and what lies ahead of us is tiny matters compared to what lives within us. What lives within us is already living inside of everyone if you're just willing to acknowledge that it's there. But something seems, seems like something has to sort of stimulate it Otherwise, you get wrapped up in the world, and you get wrapped up in the world, and you think the world is real. <laughs> you think all this, this stuff that's going on on the news. It, it's None of that is eternal. None of that is going to last. Everything dissipates and disappears, including all of the, quote, personalities that seem to constitute the world. It's not that we're not real. It's not that there's not a real spirit. It's not that there's not a real mind. But the way it is, we've got a drama. We've got a soap opera going on inside our heads most of the time. That soap opera, that drama, keeps us from being able to see into eternity. So. Well said. Well said. We're we're uh, coming up on our time here for a break. And uh, before we go to break, uh, I would like to mention that you can see how rich topic is. I'm so glad you were able to do the show with me this week, John, because I know sure. you've got your class on miracles and mysticism, and people mm-hmm. can jump in and join uh, at any right. point. And uh, this is your second class that you're doing on video on the platform of Zoom, which I use for almost all everything I do now. And I know you've been really enjoying it. People really enjoy being able to really? connect with you on the video live. It's so fun, isn't it? Oh, it really is. It's nice to be able to see the folks and all over the world. That's what's the exciting part. It's not quite the same as being in the classroom, but boy, oh boy, it's the next best thing. That's for sure. No doubt about that. Yes, it is. Yes, yeah, for best. sure. Right. You know, I'm sorry about so the I want to let. Oh, that's okay. What I'd like to let people know is that they can go to um, MiracleMagazine.com or JenniferHadley.com, and you can register if you decide you'd like to join in the class. And uh, there are payment plans available for the class. You can get started right away. 
and uh, join with John in this wonderful opportunity. And knowing that we have so many um, episodes of this radio show that people might listen to this a year from now, the, the class will still be available then, I'm sure. So it's time for us to go to a break. I'm Jennifer Hadley. My guest is John Lundy. And we're talking about A Course in Miracles. We're living the love. We're walking the talk on Unity Online Radio. And we'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm Jennifer Hadley. My guest this week is author and Missouri mystic, John Mundy. So you have your event in uh, New York State. Why don't you just say a few words about that before we pick up the topic again? Sure. Well, we're having a retreat on Columbus Day weekend. Uh, that's October 5, 6, 7, and 8. You can either leave on Sunday the 7th or you can stay and leave on uh, Monday the 8th, uh, your option. Uh, the topic is awakening to the one mind, which is something that mysticism is all about. It's about awakening to the one, realizing that there is just one mind, that we're not separate, that we're not broken off, that the ego is very broken off, it's isolated. And and it's for that very reason that it suffers. There's a line in the Course where it says, divine abstraction, which is like a name for God, takes joy in sharing, and we really do take joy, and that's our greatest joy. People are so afraid that when they die, there's going to be nothing, or they'll be isolated. It's quite the difference than that. It's actually a, a reunion with the whole, uh, rather than a breaking off of the whole. But So it's about awakening to the one mind. And you just go to our website, miraclesmagazine.org, to find out more about it. It's coming up. Uh, just a couple of weeks. Yes, and uh, I'll, I'll also mention that the reason I'm not going to be there, because John did include me, <laughs> is <Try>. literally, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was like the same day or the day after I had committed to teaching uh, in North Carolina, John asked me. So I'm going to be that same weekend. I'm going to be at the Art of Living Retreat Center in the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina, I'm offering my Forgive and Be Free retreat, which is a, a, a small, intimate gathering uh, for deep healing for those who have had enough and they're willing to reclaim their energy and stop investing it in unforgiveness. And what I can tell you is that uh, it's very common for people who attend my events to have uh lasting physical, emotional, mental <clears throat> healing, and certainly relationship healing. And we're coming up to the holidays, uh, so I, I I like to put a lot of attention on doing the deep healing forgiveness work before the holidays so that we're not repeating the same paid, painful patterns of the past. So if you'd like to come join me, I encourage you, we have payment plans. I always have payment plans for people who would like to do the deep work. And uh, following my Forgive and Be Free retreat is my spiritual counseling training intensive, which is open to anyone and everyone. We've had everyone from lawyers, uh, medical doctors, uh, uh, accountants, uh, all kinds of people, as well as life coaches, grandparents, uh, people who would like to be spiritual counselors, people who would like to be coaches, people who are coaches, family therapists, long-time therapists, all kinds of people come to my spiritual counseling training intensive to earn their CEUs and to uh, learn mystical, really, truly, uh, spiritual techniques that they can use for themselves and their clients and to deepen your ability to listen and to communicate. It's really so much about communication. John, um, you know, which leads me to another question. John, I've been a spiritual counselor for 18 years now, seeing clients and couples and even business partners. You still do counseling, don't you? Do you have information about that on your website? Well, just that it's there and that it's uh, available. People, there's a number that they can call and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So you've been doing counseling uh, for 
many decades. And so uh, I, I just bring it up. I always bring it up when I've got uh, someone who does counseling uh, on the show because many times people uh, are struggling on their own and they don't even realize right. that spiritual counseling is available because it's a very different thing from psychological and sure. uh, and it's it's deeply healing and transformative and um, um, so there's that. Now I, I would like mm-hmm. to ask you a follow-up question to what you were sharing before the break. And uh, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but I just do want to say, when you were talking about Einstein, I Mm -hmm. immediately got a thought about Helen Shookman, whom you knew, and she was your Mm -hmm. uh, therapist, right? Um, Right. That these two are unlikely mystics, and I feel (laughs) as though they they were, they had their professions, Helen as a therapist and, a, and an educator mm-hmm. at Columbia University, and Einstein as this physicist, this mathematician, and that they could bring us these treasured mystical insights precisely because they were so unlikely. They weren't ministers. They weren't priests. They weren't nuns and monks. What, right, what do you think right. about that? Well, yeah, that's good because, you know, they didn't have any kind of uh, training of that sort. So another word that we could use besides training is uh, indoctrination. You know, they didn't <laughs> have the indoctrination that comes to us from something like the church, you know. And with all of its rules and regulations and requirements and practice, they were probably distracted by, by that whole thing. Mm-hmm. So they there is... It's interesting. Can I share a quote with you from David Spindle Ross? I don't know whether you know who he is or not. Uh, no, I Ross don't. Please. A, well, he's a was a he's a Trappist. He's still around. He's uh, ninety two years old, I think, at this point. But he was a, a Trappist uh, Benedictine monk uh, who got permission somehow or another to study Buddhism. He was simply a link between the Buddhists and the Christians. And uh, he wound up getting so much into Buddhism that he's sort of a Christian Buddhist. It's a sort of a strange thing to say, but I love this quote from him. It's like, this is a, <clears throat> religion start with mysticism. There's no other way to start a religion. Eventually, every, how, eventually, however, religion tends to lose the direct tie to the mystical from which they grew. So, Jesus, I'm not quoting him now, but Jesus was a mystic, Buddha was a mystic, Muhammad was a mystic, and, and they all got, it's interesting if you look at their life stories, I mean, Jesus is off wandering in the wilderness when he has this really most profound experience, Buddha studying in the Bodhi tree, Muhammad's meditating in a cave, I mean, it all really starts when they're alone and isolated and they break through and begin to have this kind of conversation with God. So, Let me go back to the quote from uh, David. He says, I compare this to a volcano that gushes forth. That's the mystical experience. Mm. And then the magma flows down the side of the mountain and it cools off. And when it reaches the bottom, (laughs) it just rocks. You'd never guess that there was fire in it. So after a couple of hundred years or 2,000 years or more, what was once alive is a dead rock. I'm talking about religion doctrines become doctrinaire, morals become moralistic, ritual becomes ritualistic. What do we do with it? We have to push through the crust and go to the fire that's within it. It it starts, everything starts in mysticism and then it gets codified and and made into rules and laws and creeds and doctrines. And and then it becomes, that's, that's one of the reasons the churches are dying today. It's lost the fire. It, it's lost the energy that, that was there in the beginning for, for everyone. you got to rediscover. And what, what's nice about A Course in Miracles is A Course in Miracles and other things like A Course in Miracles. A Course says of itself, it's just one form of a universal course. It gets you back to the fire. It gets you back to that energy. It gets you back to that. And remember what the course is all about. It's about a, a word that I really like and not a lot is remembering, but more important than remembering is recognizing, recognizing 
bringing it back into the mind with the mind already knows we already know all of this. So that's what happens is we just recognize. I think that's also one of the things that happens with folks when they pass away. When they die, it's, it's the recognizing nothing is lost. You're going home. Why do we talk about people? People very often on their deathbeds are saying, I want to go home. I can tell you story after story after story that I've heard of people saying, I want to go home. <laughs> Just happened recently with a friend of mine. She, yeah. Her husband thought he was having heart. I thought he was having um, stomach problems, went to the doctor, went to the hospital. And uh, while they were waiting on some diagnosis stuff, he was sitting in a chair in his, he was not in the bed, but in a chair in the hospital mm-hmm. room. And he starts saying to his wife, I want to go home. She thought he meant he wanted to go back to their house. Right. She got up to go to the bathroom, and while she was gone to the bathroom, he went home. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> to his real home, you know. Right. This is not, there's a line in the course with less than 49 that says, This is not your real home. You do not live here. And so many people realize that this is not true. But they don't know how to find the way back home, even while they're in this world. That's the trick. The trick is being able to do it while you're still here in this world. Mm -hmm. Yes. For me, uh, it's been such a journey of hating this world to now loving it. Mm. And with all of its expressions, because now recognizing that it's impermanent, that it's not real, but we are real and we are permanent, not here, but in God, no. I can handle, I don't have to hate this world anymore. I don't have to hate my experience. No. Hey, I, I'd and, like to go back to this theme of sure. your book, which is A Course in Miracles and Mysticism and the Great Mystics. And... Um, what are some of the things that you learned in writing the book? Well, just an affirmation, I guess, of um, of so much that's universally true. Um, that the Course in Miracles also talks about. The Course in Miracles is a mystical document. It's mm-hmm. the most profound, I think, uh, mystical document ever across the face of planet Earth. Although there's lots of times, you know, if you go back and you look at somebody like Swedenborg, Swedenborg was the course oh, in miracles in the 18th century, you know, and and you can kind of just going through that. There was Gnosticism that was deeply mystical, and they teach you Neoplatonism, you know, the Kabbalah. It's in there, but the thing about the course in miracles is the 21st century. When it, it was written during the latter quarter of the 20th century. I once said to Ken Watner, why do you think we got this now? Why did this come to us now? And he said he didn't know the answer to that for sure, but there was one thing he was sure of. It could not have happened until after Freud. Because it wasn't until Freud that we had a really clear ego psychology. He understood the ego very well. The problem with Freud was that he was an atheist. And being an atheist, he did not see an out. He did, there was not a door. There was no exit. You were just trapped inside this ego thing, and there was no freedom from it. Well, it's no accident that Helen was a Freudian. Helen understood Freud very well, but she had this ability to open her mind in such a way that she could see the door. She could see the exit. She could see the way out. And then, you know, Jesus could come speak to her and and show us uh, what that exit looks like and even provide a very clear textbook to describe how you get out of here safely and how you remember home. Right. So, yeah. And we have Jung. And we have Jung. Yeah, Jung was, uh, um, it's a very interesting thing about Jung. Jung (laughs) said of himself, and I think in his, in the Red Book, that he was not a mystic which is really interesting because he says, I'm a scientist first, which is sort of interesting because so much of what he said is is purely a clear sign of being aware of the collective mind. Yes, yes, yes. You know, the, so he was that despite the fact that he resisted being called that. 
on his own. But it, it really opened up the whole world. He, he saw what he did believe in God. I mean, there was no doubt about right. that. Yeah. 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 yeah right. right. Well, and, and uh, it makes sense to me that as a, also being a scientist, and many mystics <clears throat> are very scientific, like Einstein. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, they're super scientific and because their mind is so vast. Uh, they right. can they can hold it all and not see contradictions and not have to close off any part of it. Had had he claimed mm-hmm. uh, mystic, uh, perhaps his work would have been um, less valuable to people because of their well, you know, not being yeah. religious or spiritual themselves, and then discounting it because of yeah. the spiritual nature of it. So makes sense mm-hmm. in. In your experience of uh, writing the book and studying these mystics, did you come to a greater appreciation of the Course? Oh, sure. How, how, how could you not? You know, I mean, it's all there. It's all in, in the Course. What the mystics see is, is what, what my book is about is really kind of comparing the insights of mystics with the teachings of the Course in miracles, in a way saying, Look, this isn't new. What's new is the packaging. What's new is the way that that it's all laid out so clearly, and very, very clearly, and by a psychologist who was able to describe all this process that we have to go through to awaken. This is a that's why our theme for the retreat is coming: kind of awakening to the one mind. We are awakening to this remember remembrance of the truth that's always been there. Indeed. There's a lot the course is trying to, and you know when you when you get that this is not a real world, um, I mean that it that really bothers people sometimes. But it just <laughs> means that it's made. It's just it's made up. It's a construct. It's a concept. It could have been made up lots of different. In fact, as you travel very much, you see there's a lot of ways of making it. You study history, you see all kinds of ways of making it up, but it still winds up being made up. And one of the things the mystic sees that is the Course says very clearly that time, time itself is, time is where the story is. And the story isn't real. But, the, you know, it's like when you have a dream at night and you're dreaming, it all looks very real, but it also occurs in time. You're going through, there's an event and then there's another event and then there's another event. In a way, what the Course is saying is, well, actually, it uses, says that time's a vast illusion, it, that it, it's relative. That's Einstein's discovery. It can speed up, it can slow down. And what's really interesting is what happens if it stops? You know, if we could really stop all the machinations of the mind, you you really can't. Trying to, meditation gets us there, it opens a door for it, but then you've got to kind of go into that door. And then it's, the Course also helps us understand that even though there is a story, the Course says the script is written, or as Einstein said, God does not play dice with the universe, you know, and so there's a process, and the more we can connect with that process, I've been studying lately, I'm reading a, a, a book um, on Dharma, which is a, a Hindu concept, which is really just the concept that everything, if even include every one of our thoughts, every word that we say, every action, but let's go back to the root. Back to the root is thought. Every thought has its effect in the universe, and it especially has an effect in our lives. So if we're angry, if we're attacking, if we're projective, we're blind, we cannot see. That's why the Course is trying to, to just, there are, 34 times that the Course in Miracles uses the phrase, watch your thoughts. Watch what are you thinking? And why are you thinking that? Why are you angry? Why are you attacking? Why are you being disappointed? Why are you being upset? You know, where is that coming from? That Those kind of thoughts can only come from an ego. You are not an ego. That's the very basic clear message of the Course. Your spirit, your mind, you're part of God. And that's what we got to get back to, to remember. Another way to say that 
is to say that there, there's no duality, there's no other, there is no subject. This is a mystic's great discovery. There's no subject object. There's the later course. In, there's a wonderful line. I love little like five word sentences in the later course. One of them is, "There's nothing outside of you." Now, what it means when it says nothing outside of you it means there's nothing outside of your mind. Everything is a part of the mind. I listen to the uh, astrophysicists like Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about dark energy, like this, it's the thing, 85% of the universe is made up of this thing which we cannot see because it doesn't reflect light. And yet we know that it's there because there's this gravitational pull about it. It's affecting everything. And I think, well, why don't we call this huge, invisible thing that's really kind of running or operating the universe, why don't we call it mind? Why don't we call it God? Why don't we call it love? Why don't we call it what it is? <laughs> you know, instead of just limiting it somehow or another to some uh, physics. It's not. Right. The, it's not just physics. You know. Well, I mean, this is all. It's just fun stuff. It's really fun stuff to think about. My goodness. It is. It, it's so. Mu- it's so liberating. I, I remember. Years ago, I, I wrote an article for Science of Mind magazine about um, Lynn McTaggart's work um, in her book, The Field. And uh, mm. so, yeah, she she called it The Field and uh, right. the field of energy instead of the mind. And uh, uh-huh. there are experience, <clears throat> experiments that have been done, obviously, many people know them, with working with the field or the mind to shift things. Uh, One experiment that was so powerful was um, a a group of a couple thousand people committing to meditate every day in um, Mm. the Washington, D.C. area, and the crime rate went down by 25% while they were doing it. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that great? It is. Mm. And, uh, yeah. You don't know. I mean, you don't know how how there's a line of course you do not know how powerful your thoughts are and for example if the mind can heal the body but the body can't heal the mind then obviously mind is a stronger thing here <laughs> so again what are you thinking yes and the now, body you... is the tool a tool of the mystic that we can use the body to help us Connect with the mind by yeah. the, by shifting our. You know, we we all can experiment with taking our awareness from where our physical body is and where we think we are is sitting behind our eyeballs, and we can project right. our mind to uh, the past, to the future, to a distant place. All kinds of, we can project our mind all over the place and we mm-hmm. know this, but then we feel trapped in the body. So this is the right. time of the, the everyday mystic, the ordinary mystic and, mm-hmm. and realizing that this is our, as you said, it's our naturalness. That's our natural state. Right. And I'm so glad you're doing this class at this time. I think it's, yeah, I know good. that people are really loving it. And uh, we are about out of time here. It goes so quickly. It does. Uh, I, it goes just like that. And I'd like to remind people that both John and I are doing different events. That first weekend in October, John has this wonderful gathering in New York State. And you can go for a day or you can go for the weekend. And then I have my Forgive and Be Free retreat in uh, North Carolina, followed by the Spiritual Counseling Training Intensive. So you can come for the weekend or you can come for 10 days or you can come just for the training, whichever you prefer. And uh, John's class, you can go to Miracle Magazine. Is it .com or .org? .org, O-R-G. .org. And uh, you can look for his events there and the class there. Also, you can subscribe to Miracles Magazine, which has articles by people like me. And, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and 
And lot, I mean, that magazine is packed. That is uh, a wonderful resource, and people hold on to them because they're so, so much a resource, and you can get back issues too, I believe. And um, sure. so I encourage people to look for that, to check out John's book, uh, Miracles and Mysticism. And I'd like to say thanks to all the people who support this radio show and make contributions to Power of Love Ministry uh, to support the show and to support the free text messaging that we're doing, the free classes that we do, the transcribing of the radio show, all these different things that we do. Much appreciated. And it's time for us to close. So I invite everyone, we take a breath. We give thanks to the higher Holy Spirit self leading us and guiding us all the way every day. Thanks to John Mundy. In gratitude, we let our healing and expansion be. We know it's done, and so it is. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you for tuning in to A Course in Miracles, Living the Love, Walking the Talk, with Rev. Jennifer Hadley. Join us every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Central for more tools and insights into how to express your beliefs from moment to moment, every day, in every way. A Course in Miracles, Living the Love, Walking the Talk, only on Unity Online Radio, the voice of an awakening world. This program is brought to you in part by JenniferHadley.com, a global resource providing tools, insight, and support for those seeking to live A Course in Miracles every day in every way. Online at www.JenniferHadley.com. While there, we invite you to visit Jennifer's blog, where you can join with the community of like-minded people who have become Jennifer's prayer partners through her daily power prayer. Like them, you can enjoy this extra support as you come to walk your talk and live A Course in Miracles every day in every way.